Good evening, um, Mr. Deputy President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, alumni, students, colleagues, esteemed guests. As President of SOAS, it's my great pleasure to invite you and welcome you to this uh, very special um, event. My name is Zainab Badawi, and it's uh, a great um, pleasure to have the Deputy President, Paul Mashatile of South Africa, and um, High Commissioner, and our very special guest from South Africa this evening. So um, it's actually very auspicious, Mr. Deputy President, that it is, uh, we're celebrating 30 years of that very, very landmark, wonderful, heroic year. It was a very productive year, very productive year for me, actually, because the first of my four children was born that same year. So um, he, he is definitely a born free, and uh, I'm very, very glad that it was such a landmark year for me, both personally and also as an African. Um, you know, we have very deep ties here at SOAS with um, South Africa, <clears throat> Not to say we're very grateful that you've um, given us the export in the form of Professor Adam Habib, and uh, it's uh, a shame that he can't be with us uh, this evening for various reasons. But, you know, we have very, very strong connections that we really value across government, academia, and business, and they're very important to us. And, in fact, just to name one, in partnership with South Africa, we're very firm in our mission to reimagine higher education um, we're very, very keen to nurture the ties between the so-called global north and global south and to say actually the lines are blurred between the two. We're now in the second academic year of a landmark partnership with the University of the Strand in Johannesburg, a joint doctoral program in applied development economics. And it's the first fully equitable partnership at SOAS to introduce a program with a single fee structure for both domestic and international students. No difference whatsoever there. Um, and um, it's a great um, honour to be listening to you um, make your comments, not only to tell us about, give us your insights about the government of national unity, those of us who have been following events very, very avidly, in um, South Africa in the last year or so particularly, but also because South Africa assumes the presidency of the G20 in December, and of course you'll be hosting the G20 summit um, next year. But before we hear from you, Mr. Deputy President, I'd like to introduce the Minister of Planning, Monetary and Evaluation, Ms. Marapini Ramakopa. And uh, Marapini, we met a long, long time ago in Arusha in Tanzania, when you were a member of the ANC Youth League, if I remember rightly. And so it's uh, fast forward a few years and look at you. And um, you are now Deputy Secretary, Secretary General of the uh, ANC, and you've been in post for about a year um, as minister. And you've been very active at various levels of the ANC, particularly in the Youth League, as I said, but also in the Women's League. So um, please do introduce your Deputy President for us and feel at liberty to say a little bit more if you wish. Thank you, Marapini. Thank you very much, Zainab, and good evening, or is it good? Is it, it is evening. Good evening to everyone. And let me take this opportunity, of course, to acknowledge um, the Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa, who's also the Deputy President of um, the African National Congress. And let me also greet everyone that is here, the ministers that we came with, um, 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 and the officials from um, South African government that are very excited to be here. And all of you, of course, that are here, the staff members and everybody else that is a leader of uh, this auspicious um, um, institution. Um, it is true, that, indeed, that in 2013, I was just reminding her, I said, you will not remember me. I did. <laughs> but at some conference, um, you, you did interview me. I was representing the ANC Youth League, and um, um, it was quite uh, an exciting time, of course. And you still look young, still looks the same. But we really You can excited. come back again. <laughs> <laughs> We're excited to be here, um, most especially because we are here on a... On a to unlock investment opportunities and partnership. And we gather here at this uh, um, auspicious um, um, 
um, University this evening. We're really excited precisely because South has uh, close ties with South Africa. And many South Africans have been educated at this institution, including our Deputy President, who's still a student here as well. <laughs> so. I guess most of us need to come and also uh, um, uh, further our studies here to follow our deputy president. South has also for strong partnership, of course, with South African institutions of higher education, becoming a very important partner to our country's development. This partnership, of course, between South Africa and the United Kingdom, of course, is important, most especially because uh, we are taking presidency, I think you all know, of the G20, and uh, we are advancing um, the, the message of saying that uh, we, we, we hope to uh, make sure that we do build relationships that would assist us to continue with our developmental agenda as a country, but to build stronger relations so that whatever it is that we'll be doing commercially and whatever it is that we'll be doing in the, um, 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 developing young minds uh, such as yourself will then now be able to bring us all together as a globe and make um, this globe that we are living in a little bit smaller. The Deputy President, of course, as you may all be aware, is the Deputy President of uh, a new government, a government that is called the Government of uh, National Unity. Um, in, on the um, 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 29th of May 2024, South Africa went for an election, and uh, that election happened the way that it did, and no one got uh, um, um, a majority um, um, in terms of votes. So we had to come up with the leadership that would then now take us forward, and the deputy president and the president of the country had to sit down and lead a negotiation that then now allowed us to have the government that we have today. This deputy president, of course, of ours, as I've already said, has led the ANC in um, Gauteng, which is the hub, the economic hub of our country, but not only the economic hub, it is also a, a, a higher institution hub as well, so it becomes an intellectual hub of our country. He has led it as the chairperson. He has led it also as um, the secretary of uh, the province. He has also led it as the secretary of um, um, the South African Communist Party. So he then now later on moved on and became the treasurer general of the ANC, and later on in 2022, he was elected the deputy president of the ANC. Then later on in 2023, the president appointed him for the first time as uh, the deputy president of the country. He also led a number of uh, youth movements. So he has been a student activist as well. So it means that the democracy that we are celebrating today the 30th democracy, he built it during his time when he was still your age, and he had made sure that whatever it is that he was doing, we then now would be able to celebrate the democracy and the freedom that South Africans are today talking about, and Africa is also celebrating. Ladies and gentlemen, let me take this opportunity to ask our Deputy President to give us this lecture that we've been waiting for for quite a very long time. Mr. <laughs> Deputy President. I should say there'll be an opportunity for Q&A after the Deputy President has finished his address. Is this one on? Thank you, Marupin, for the introduction. Uh, Marupin has a very long title. Uh, it's called Minister in the Presidency responsible for monitoring, evaluation, planning, <laughs> planning. Uh, <clears throat> and she likes saying to people, I'm her boss, but uh, I think when it's said all of the, all, when it's all said and done, she's a boss of all of us, <laughs> because you must check whether we have proper plans, and then she come to monitor them, evaluate them, and she tells us if we are going wrong. But thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, <clears throat> President uh, Zain, once again, uh, thank you for uh, inviting us and receiving us uh, this afternoon. Let me also recognize ministers and deputy ministers who 
are traveling with us. Uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Education, Professor Joanna Newman. Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Knowledge Exchange, Professor Laura Hammond. Deputy Vice Chancellor for Finance and Operation, Kadit Mier. And all professors uh, here present, uh, I may not have been given a list of everybody, uh, but all of you distinguished guests, uh, good evening to all of you, including our High Commissioner who has joined us, Dr. Mamabulu, um, Deputy High Commissioner as well, Dineo Matlako. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start by saying that I am truly honored to have been invited to address this esteemed gathering, SOS uh, University, this afternoon. Uh, I also want to thank SOAS uh, for accepting me to do my postgraduate studies at this university. However, Marupin, <laughs> owing to increased workload, <laughs> I had to delay my studies. Uh, and I think uh, you might think I'm running away. <laughs> I had to delay my studies, uh, <clears throat> especially this year because of uh, a lot of responsibilities that came with the government of national unity. Uh, I do think things will settle down at some point. Um, and now that I'm here, uh, I'm sure I will be motivated to return uh, to come and continue my studies. Let me also thank so as for having open doors for many students all over the world, uh, especially from the African continent. Uh, many of them have achieved their master's degrees, and you may not believe that, in fact, many of them are ministers in government, uh, some of them CEO of major corporates and banks. Um, so. We must thank uh, SOS uh, for that. In one of our South African languages, Sisotu, uh, we say uh, meaning we thank you most sincerely. We want you to continue to offer these kind of opportunities to many out there especially in the African continent. I'm currently the chairperson of the Human Resource Development Council in government, and I would like to create an opportunity uh, for the HRDC <coughs> to partner with SOAS so that we can increase skills that are required by our economy, particularly focusing on young people. My delegation and I, as Minister Marupin Ramakupa said, are here in the United Kingdom to build on the outcomes of the state visit that was undertaken by President Ramaphosa in 2022, with a specific focus on how we can work together to ensure inclusive economic growth and ensure a balance and increase of trade between South Africa and the United Kingdom. Uh, as I said earlier, some of the ministers uh, will be interacting with you this, this evening. Some are busy with other meetings elsewhere, but also there are some government officials here you, you can chat to later. As we gather here today, we all know that there are major mega trends uh, that are influencing the world, including globalization, geopolitical inequalities, environmental crisis, climate change, demographic changes, and also technology conver convergence, but 
more seriously, poverty and wars. Let's look at some of the statistics. The current global population is estimated to be 7.7 billion people. <coughs> However, forecasts indicate that it will grow to 8.5 billion by 2030 and 9.7 billion by 2050. Half of the 2 billion individuals predicted to be added to this population actually come from Africa. The problem is that as the population growth increases, inequality also rises, endangering peace and stability worldwide, and especially in Africa. Furthermore, the world is rapidly urbanizing with predictions that 70% of the world's population will reside in cities by 2030. This is a call for investing where people reside. Specifically, we need to focus also on rural infrastructure uh, because if we don't do so, people leave for the cities. Uh, so it's important that we should prioritize uh, developments uh, in our rural areas. Um, I visited China uh, at some point when I was still chairman of the ANC in Gauteng, and one of the things they indicated to my delegation was that they had a big challenge of many people in rural areas moving to cities. They decided at that time that they must now put a lot of infrastructure in rural areas, ensure that there are proper roads, uh, telecommunication, and it worked for them. Because as you know, that China is a big population, and their migration to cities were millions of people. And because of that approach, they were able uh, to get more people to stay in rural areas and farm, proper roads to take their products to cities and did not have to leave rural areas. So we should see this as a chance to attract more investors to rural areas. As we said earlier, we are talking to a lot of investors here in, in London, and most of them are happy to come to South Africa to invest, and we brought amongst us the Deputy Minister of Agriculture, who has been talking to them about opportunities in those uh, uh, rural and farming areas. As government, we believe that we must prioritize urban planning solutions that can also adapt to these changes. This includes investing in ecosystem and infrastructure needed to ensure a decent standard of living for all people. This will also necessitate the building of new cities on well-located land with amenities to ensure a better, uh, <coughs> better life for all citizens. We made a mistake when we came into power 30 years ago because we were under pressure to provide housing to our people. We started building houses closer to where the townships are. Now, if you know South Africa, you know that most of our townships are outside uh, major cities. In fact, a bit far away from industries. Uh, and people are spending a lot of money taking, paying for transport to reach their places of employment. Uh, we later realized that that's a big problem and we have started uh, changing that. Uh, and I had an opportunity at some point to be a provincial minister of housing. We call them in South Africa MECs. Uh, MECs mean member of the executive council. Uh, the national minister said 
to us at the time when we came into power in 1994 and they said to us, don't call yourself ministers. You are MECs. <laughs> <laughs> so we couldn't use a word provincial minister or anything. They said, don't touch. <laughs> so we were MECs. We are still MECs <laughs> in, if you are in a province. So, so I happened to be an MEC for housing and we started turning that around and started identifying well-located land closer to industries and building houses and including social housing because the subsidy from the South African government focused on people who were at the low end. Uh, I think those were earning even less than 5,000 a month household income. And there was, though, there was a gap. Those who were earning a bit more than that, seven, 8,000 a month, but can't get bonds from banks were left out. So we start, started introducing solutions to address uh, people who are in that uh, gap market so that they can also get housing. And that <coughs> uh, necessitated us to build a lot of social housing, including flats. Uh, South African people did not like flats. Uh, and not like here in London. <laughs> Everybody want their yard and, and so on. So we had to say to people, look, there are many people who need housing. We had to start building flats uh, through social housing. Now, according to the 2023 Atlas of Sustainable Goals, the global Gini coefficient has fallen. Uh, since 1990, from about 70 to 6 62 percent in 2019, which represents significant progress in reducing global inequality. This suggests that despite progress in reducing inequality, a significant gap still exists. Uh, between the rich and the poor, indicating the need for more global work to promote economic equality. As I said earlier, climate change is one of the most pressing issues of our time, and as we all know, it poses a significant threat to humanity and the planet. It is a complex problem that demands urgent and consistent action from every individual organization and government. So our government has committed to using the insights and recommendation from, uh, this, from the State of Climate Action in South Africa report to inform the scaling up of the country's actions to respond to climate change. We have also agreed that <coughs> when we host the G20 next year, this will be one of the important agenda items because we're taking over from Brazil by the 1st of December. South Africa will take over the presidency of, of the G20 and we are hosting the G20 in 2025. We are actively adopting sustainable practices to reduce the carbon footprint. The global community must unite to address this issue with utmost seriousness and commitment. So this is a very important issue and uh, uh, even in my meeting before I came here with the Secretary of State uh, E.D. Meliband, we discussed this matter uh, regarding the issue of climate change, uh, the net zero, how do we move through the just transition, and also the support that the big economies can give uh, to us in the developing world. Uh, <coughs> the other thing that is important that worries everybody is the need for peace in the world. So we call upon world leaders to work for peace. Uh, in particular, 
in Africa, as you know, <coughs> we still have conflicts in places like Sudan, the DRC, Mozambique, and so on. But we also want to ensure ceasefire uh, so that in places like Palestine, the people of Palestine can rebuild and establish an independent state existing side by side with Israel. They deserve that. Yes. We must do everything in our power to end conflict in the Sudan, in the DRC, and all other parts of the world. Uh, my message is always the wars must end. Let's resolve our differences through negotiations. So that's, that's what we're going to continue to do. As some of you might recall that our president actually led a delegation with other presidents uh, to go to Kiev in Ukraine uh, to really try to, to uh, persuade uh, the parties in conflict there to negotiate a peaceful settlement. Uh, and I remember asking the president uh, a question, how did you get there? Because, you know, there are missiles everywhere. So he said, we had to take a train. So I was imagining a, the president in a train. Uh, so I said, was it a blue train? <laughs> he said, no, an ordinary train. My back is still so. <laughs> <laughs> but it showed the commitment of leaders to peace. They took a train uh, right into Kiev to try and negotiate for peace. Uh, I was told by <coughs> the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs here that he, he also took a train uh, when we met this morning. Uh, but we, we really sincerely call all the leaders, let's commit uh, to peace uh, so that citizens can get an opportunity to better their life, concentrate on important things, to grow their economies, and be able to look after their families. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to speak a little bit uh, about what's happening in our country, the country of Nelson Mandela, Bishop Tutu, Ruth First, Fatima Mie, Albert Lutuli, Oliver Tambo, Winnie Mandela, and many great heroes and heroines of our people. Now, what happened in this land of Nelson Mandela this year is that our voters who casted their votes, they did so in a manner that did not give any particular party a majority. Uh, you are all aware of that. You know, when we election, <coughs> were campaigning, I got asked this question many a times. Uh, what do you think the ANC will get in this uh, election? And I said, well, I think 57%. <laughs> and in one of the rallies I was, somebody says, no, no, DP. I think 60, <laughs> uh, but it was not to be. Uh, so come the result, uh, the, when the results were coming in, we all wake up in the morning to check the screens, and I realized that we are below 50. Uh, so I called one of our <coughs> deputy secretaries who was the comrade Nomvula, and uh, saying, hey, I'm worried about this. And she said, no, Spokes, don't worry. They call me Spokes. <laughs> don't worry, Spokes, this thing is going to change. <laughs> you know, we're still expecting a lot of numbers from Soweto and all these places. So I, I felt better. Uh, come the evening, 
slowly I went to sleep, wake up in the morning, check, yeah, 42. <laughs> I was like, no. No, don't worry. <laughs> it will become better. And, uh, <coughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, the voting ended. And where we, where we were at that time was 40.8. And it, that was it. They were closing. And we realized, and one of my friends, Nkenke uh, Kakana, uh, called me and said, we have lost the elections. Uh, he says, because he was at the voting station, so he says one of the biggest challenge he had was how do I call my leaders and tell them this? Uh, so he did, and he said, we have lost the elections. Uh, so we then decided, what do we do uh, at that point? And the president said, look, let's constitute a negotiating team that can start talking to other parties. We did so, <coughs> spoke to the EFF, spoke to MK Party, Democratic Alliance. At the end of those negotiations, we had spoken to 18 parties. Uh, but then the challenge was that they all came with conditions. So the EFF said, we will work with you if you don't bring the DA. OK. Uh, MK party, we will work with you, but Ramaphosa must go. Wow. So that's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do we let our president go just like that? <laughs> so, so they were not in. In fact, many people don't even know that we met them four times and we didn't win. The EFF. Uh, four times, no, we're not coming in. Uh, we don't want to work with neoliberals. Okay. So the president said, okay, let's continue to talk to others. Now the team was saying, the guys who have one seat, president said, yeah, talk to them. And you won't believe today the government of national unity is constituted, amongst others, by people who have two seats, one seat. Now, the biggest challenge, of course, was, OK, how do we share seats in cabinet? So the president said, uh, well, because these guys are committed to work with us, even if they have one seat, I'll appoint them as ministers. Very nice. Uh, in fact, one of one of the leaders, uh, Gaten McKenzie, I was with him during Heritage uh, Day in the Free State, and he said, "You know, people are saying Gaten McKenzie is happy." He said, "Yes, I'm happy. <laughs> you know, the president appointed me, uh, <clears throat> and they have. I think Gaten has about uh, three seats or, or six or so." But, but we decided, the president said, look, this is how people voted. They want us to work together. Uh, so that was the birth of the government of national unity. We are now more than 100 days in office or close to that. And you won't believe uh, <coughs> we have not been fighting. Uh, in fact, many people said this thing is not going to last. Can you imagine the DA, the ANC, that side? How do these people work together? But the president did something very clever. said, let's agree on principles, firstly. And he coined something called statement of intent. And the president was drafting this himself. He kept this and he said, this is a statement of intent. So I said, what do you want to do? He says, everybody must commit to this. Then we said, guys, anybody who comes here, respect for the Constitution, 
of South Africa, the rule of law, our independent judiciary. And we said we have to agree on a number of, of these issues, uh, advancing inclusive growth, economic growth, so that we can create jobs for our people, end poverty, deal with high cost of living, uh, and so on. So we, we agreed on all those issues that we thought they are important. And the president said, everybody who agrees with our statement of intent must sign. And I can tell you as we speak, uh, 10 parties signed. Uh, so it is 10 parties that constitute the government of, of national unity today. So our strategy as we are traveling now, we're doing it as a government of national unity. But when you meet us in these round tables here, you won't know who's ANC, who's DA. Uh, we all sing the same tune uh, because of that agreement. Uh, the president said, guys, you come from different parties, but there's one commander in chief. You all account to me as a president, and here's your Bible. Go do whatever but uh, we keep to this. <clears throat> so if you were to ask me, is the government of national unity working? The answer is yes. With, will it last for five years? I think so. Uh, <clears throat> and the reason I say I think so is because we are able to deal with the challenges that we are facing. In fact, one of the things the president did recently he said to me, you know what, <coughs> we are a government of national unity coming from different parties. I want to invite all the leaders for dinner at my house. And I said to the president, a good idea. <coughs> uh, <coughs> and the president said, guys, come. Don't bring your iPads and books. We're just going to talk, know one another and relax, uh, have dinner and drink wine. Uh, and everybody came. Uh, we have now agreed beyond that dinner that uh, we are going to create another layer as a clearing house. So that if there are issues where we don't quite agree, uh, that structure will, will deal with those issues. And the president has asked me to chair that structure. The various parties will send the, some of their leaders or the com second commander in chief of their parties to come to that structure. And we'll deal with a number of issues there. There was recently, I'm sure most of you heard about uh, some concern about the Basic Education Amendment Act, uh, National Health Insurance where some of the parties said to the president, we now agree we are government of national unity, but can we talk about national insurance? There are issues we want to raise. So that structure will become the clearing house for those issues. But also plans for the future, we will also uh, discussing uh, the issues that relate to the, co the, the convening and hosting of the G20 next year. So when we go back next week to South Africa, that, uh, that structure will be meeting to look at issues that we should process so that when the leaders under the president meet, we would have processed a number of those issues. So ladies and gentlemen, as I've said, <coughs> we will assume the G20 presidency on the 1st of December this year. Uh, following the G20's leaders' summit under Brazil, uh, which is scheduled for 18 to 19th November in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, so beyond that, it will be South Africa's turn. Uh, and we want to do this in collaboration with the African Union and bring a lot of people uh, closer to us, particularly to bring in 
the AU's Agenda 2063, uh, which is the Africa we want. There are many people uh, who want to get closer uh, to the discussion at the, at the G20. Uh, <clears throat> so we're looking how we can manage that. Uh, so some people said to me recently, can we attend as observers? Um, uh, so we, we're going to create an opportunity where we'll have the friends of the G20 uh, so that people are able to attend and we can discuss a number of, of issues there. Uh, of course, the G20 remains sensitive to the needs of Africa and the Global South developing economies. As South Africa, we believe firmly that the G20 with the United Nations at the center are vitally important in accelerating implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. South Africa's presidency of the G20 will provide a unique opportunity to bring to the fore the needs, aspirations, and ambitions of the developing countries. That's what we're going to do. We will use this opportunity to build on the efforts and successes of those who <coughs> Uh, manage the presidency before us from the Global South, India, Brazil, uh, Indonesia. Uh, but as a country, we are considering the monitoring of past commitments. Because the problem with summits like that is that you come with good resolutions and so on, and by the time you convene again, you repeat those things. So we want to monitor and say, okay, what were the agreements, how far we are, how far are we now, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> particularly given the fact that we are now at the end of the cycle uh, when it comes to South Africa. So we are going to specifically look at sustainable development goals, and that's one of the things that Marupin is doing. Uh, to look at that. Uh, so that this forum or this forum, like others, does not become a talk shop. Uh, because people like summits and conferences, uh, but we want to focus on implementation. Because we are worried about lack of progress in some of uh, the commitments that uh, have been made. Uh, particularly, the lack of progress in enhancing uh, these SDGs uh, globally, uh, looking at issues such as growing inequality, rising hunger, uh, rising extreme poverty, uh, the issue that I raised earlier about uh, climate change, <coughs> energy crisis. As you know, in South Africa, we come from serious problems of load shedding, but also the debt crisis. Many countries in the, in the south, the developing countries, are facing huge debts, uh, illicit financial flows, uh, all of which impedes development, particularly uh, in uh, developing countries. So we will prioritize these issues. Uh, <coughs> One of the issues that Maropin has been talking about when we meet investors uh, passionately is the issue of local beneficiation. We have become an extractive economy. Uh, a lot of manganese take off the ground, China. Uh, so we have been taking out our mineral resources. Of course, we get some resources from that, but we don't think it's a sustainable way of doing things. So we are now focusing on local beneficiation, and <clears throat> we are saying to investors, yes, come to South Africa. We do have manganese, but you can produce finished goods here. Because if you do so, you'll employ people here. Yeah. Because otherwise, how do we gain employment if uh, 
we just extract and uh, export our min minerals all over the world. So, so there is a critical mineral strategy that we have worked on that will address this matter. Um, the other issue that we are focusing on, which will also uh, put on the agenda of the G20, is, is the reform of global governance uh, systems. Uh, it was discussed under the presidency of Indonesia, in, in India, and Brazil. We're going to focus on it again. Uh, we want to ensure that we look at the financial architecture and reform of an institution like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and multilateral development banks. Uh, we are already discussing those issues, and we think it will be important that at the G20, uh, these issues must not be lost. The theme for the G20 next year will be solidarity, uh, equality, and sustainable development. Uh, that's what we're going to focus on. It is worth noting that while South Africa continues to prepare for its G20 presidency, we have been engaging broadly with other G20 members, including the United Kingdom, as I said earlier. We convened at the Sherpa level and also participated in February at the G20 foreign ministers meeting in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So South Africa will continue with the discussion around the reform of these global uh, systems of government uh, under our presidency. The reforms of the global governance institutions, we believe it's very important, and therefore we're going to make, make it an important matter. We want also to reaffirm our unwavering convi conviction that modernizing the United Nations to make it more effective, agile, and action-oriented, forward-looking, inclusive, and representative of current geopolitical relations and in the international community is essential. Uh, South Africa has always been vocal about the need to reform these global systems. Uh, and we are concerned about lack of progress uh, in these areas. The international financial architect in particular has not kept pace with changing global landscapes. We urgently need bold and ambitious reforms to create stable, sustainable, and inclusive international financial architecture, which will broaden and strengthen the voice and participation of the developing economies, uh, ensure international economic decision-making, uh, norm-setting, and global economic governance in particular. We need to transform these institutions to make them fit for purpose, including by setting more ambitious targets for grant and concessional financing, enhancing multilateral, multilateral coordination on debt, drawing in the private sector, and ensuring equal participation in decision making. Ladies and gentlemen, as I move towards closure, uh, let me say that while South Africa continues to prepare for its G20 presidency, we want to move towards concrete deliverables and finalize its agenda. Uh, some of the things that I shared with you, bring them on board quickly. Uh, it is South Africa's hope that at the end of our presidency of the G20, we should look back with pride that we have been able to showcase uh, the 
amplified voice, perspective, and leadership of the developing world in tackling some of these pressing global challenges. South Africa's hope is that its presidency of the G20 will contribute to making the world more equitable, more resilient, and more sustainable. Serious challenges we are facing in the world, serious challenges we are facing as a government of national unity. But I want to echo the words of our former President Nelson Mandela when he said, it always seems impossible until it is done. So you as future leaders, we look forward to hearing from you your thoughts on how you think we should move forward, how South Africa could further leverage its presidency of G20 to deal with these challenges, these serious issues. But I have no doubt that uh, <coughs> with the kind of energy that the government of national unity has, we will succeed. Uh, and I must say that wherever we traveled, uh, Marupin was in the US uh, with the president. Uh, you know, I've been here in the UK, went to Ireland uh, on Friday. <coughs> and everywhere we go, people are very warm to to us, uh, and we think that come 2025, we will be <coughs> growing South Africa at more than 2% of GDP. We will push that over uh, the next three years to 3.5% of GDP, and by that time we will be able to create additional 1 million new employment. That's our plan. Uh, it always seems impossible until it is done. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Deputy President, for um, that tour de force there and for your candor about the GNU, the Government of National Unity. So we have about 25 minutes for some questions, and in the interest of time, I've been um, given some which have uh, circulated from the, um, from the audience. Um, but I'm going to abuse my position as moderator chair here by asking you a question first, which is, why is your nickname Spokes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I must press. Yeah. Uh, many people ask me this question, but it comes from uh, and my Shangan name is Shipokosa. You will see that on many of my speeches. So my friends from Alexander Township were not interested in this long thing, <laughs> so they just said spooks. Uh, and as I grew, they called me Bra Spooks. <laughs> So that, that's really that's the case, explanation. Because uh, you kind of threw it in, but you didn't explain what it was. Okay, good. And We've had that. Well, some yeah. people were asking me, what does it mean? And yeah. uh, I once asked my mother and says uh, to me, you know the trees that grow on the cliffs with long roots that go to look for water underground? Uh, that's what they are called, the root that never bends. Wow. Yeah. Well, we hope you'll bend a little bit to our will at the moment <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and be so kind as to answer some questions for us. Thank you. Um, okay, so, um, well, this question I know is not going to be a new one for you, but I'll ask it to you. So uh, a, a lot of uh, people are interested in this 
um, question, I find. So how does South Africa see the competition between India and China for influence in Africa? And how effectively can Africa hedge in this great power competition? Interesting they've picked India and China here. You usually get the US and China, don't you? <laughs> so there you are, a bit of geographical variation there in that question. Well, in interestingly, they are, are both our friends. Uh, <clears throat> if, if you look at who's in BRICS, they are both there, uh, India and, and China. Uh, well, the Chinese uh, strategy, as I see it, was to really have a lot of influence in the African continent. So they are not just in South Africa. In fact, if you go to a lot of parts of uh, Africa, you find Chinese uh, companies there. <coughs> uh, the Indians, on the other hand, has n have not been that aggressive with their strategy in the continent. Uh, <coughs> but we have taken a view that, well, let's engage both in trade, in, in the uh, diplomacy, <coughs> and, and so on. So I must say we work very well with them. Uh, but as you know, in South Africa, we always insist when uh, companies come from other countries, we do insist that we want empowerment. Uh, we don't impose it uh, unnecessarily, but we've got laws that says you need to be able to empower the locals, work with those who have expertise in what you're coming to do, uh, so that uh, we don't get uh, recolonized. Hmm. Uh, you know, we don't want to move from the colonization from the West and then it comes from the East. Uh, we want to work with people, possible as equal partners, but at the end, we want development. So, so when you say you don't want to replace, you know, the colonization <laughs> that came from the West with colonization from the East, it is, how successful is that drive, do you think? Because there are a lot of people who say, oh, you're just swapping one bunch of baddies for another bunch. Yeah, yeah, there are people who are saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but we are truly avoiding it. Yeah. Uh, we just make sure that... Uh, we don't accept everything. I mean, I have noticed that, uh, and it, it worried me a lot. I mean, I was in one other country when I was Minister of Arts and Culture, and I was talking to them about you know, building an uh, institution to support creative industries and so on. And when I was in that country, they said, no, we, we've, we've got huge uh, cultural center, that we built here, <coughs> and in fact, when I finally went there and saw it and saw people who were working there, I found all foreigners. Uh, so I got worried that uh, if we don't, if we are not uh, vigilant, it is easy to be recolonized, uh, mm. not by the West, mm. but also the East. So we need to be vigilant and be able to show we've got rules, we've got laws. You know, the good thing with South Africa is that we are a rule-based society. Uh, the, the rule of law is very important. In fact, when we attract investors to South Africa, we also assure them that there's an independent judiciary. You know, nobody can wake up the next day and take away your company. Uh, you can go to the courts. So a rule-based society is very important to guard against uh, people who come with uh, ulterior motives to be able to protect the locals. Okay, and just very quickly again from me, so when you as a South, a South African leader gather with your fellow African leaders, do you think continent-wide they're very alert to this? I mean, you know, I know Namibia, for instance, has banned the um, export, hasn't it, of raw lithium. It's got to, you know, they want to go up the, the value chain, as you said, you want to do with manganese and the DRC, which accounts for, what, 70% of, of cobalt, which is mined, are really reviewing their 
contracts with foreign corporations and so on. Do you think there's a real kind of shift continent-wide to make sure that the new mineral revolution is going to benefit the Africans and will those African governments also use that revenue in an equitable way? Will it be properly distributed, do you think? It will take a bit of time because <coughs> some of the countries are already indebted to other people. You know, sometimes when you are in debt, uh, it reduces your ability to be independent because those that you owe tell you what to do. Uh, so that's a big challenge okay. to get out of that. But I do see some of the countries in Africa who have begun to say, no, these are our minerals we want to control. So, so slowly we can get to that. But, you know, we must assist those who are indebted. Uh, it's, it's not an easy thing because these are debts of the past. <laughs> Some of them debts that were created by leaders who are no longer there. So the current leaders are stuck with this um, and they are trying to whittle out of it. Uh, mm. But we should get there. Okay, good. Another question here. So you talked about the fact that obviously there's a lot of conflict. You mentioned Sudan, obviously where I was born. I take a very keen interest in what you said there. And there's a question here, which is how does South Africa's government intend to improve the effectiveness of its armed forces to ensure that it can adequately, adequately contribute to overseas peacekeeping missions, such as the one in the DRC? Yes, as, as you know, we do have uh, our forces in the DRC. Mm -hmm. uh, w what really worries us, and I was discussing this with the president recently, is that, and the president was saying, you know, I'm very worried that uh, even these peacekeeping missions where we send a lot of our soldiers and so in the long run, are not going to bring us immediate results of peace. We have to focus on negotiations. So yes, we do have the army that is capable, spending a lot of resources now in the DRC, uh, <coughs> and we're not going to withdraw them now easily, but in the long run, we think we are going to put a lot of efforts in negotiation. As you know, the president was there mm. recently uh, himself. He appointed me as an envoy in South Sudan mm. <coughs> because negotiations will resolve a lot of these issues. Mm. Uh, so that's really uh, our commitment. But we'll continue to assist uh, with, with the forces that we have. It's costing us a lot of resources, um, but we will continue but we are now putting a lot of efforts on getting leaders to negotiate, less resolve this issue. Okay. Uh, and if I may just develop, because I know you were a former envoy to South Sudan, mm -hmm. but just looking at the, the conflict in Sudan, where, as you know, 150,000 people have died and there are millions on the brink of starvation and there seems to be no possibility of negotiation there. I mean, what is South Africa doing to try to resolve what is going on there? It, it is a big challenge. Uh, as you said, <coughs> the president has not asked me to uh, get involved there. He himself has been looking into that matter on how we can uh, get the leaders there to, uh, to negotiate and uh, you know stop the war. Uh, <coughs> it's something that comes out every time when we go engage in, in this multilateral fora, how do we deal with, with this problem? Uh, even when I was in Ireland, that was a big issue uh, to say, uh, how do we resolve the challenges of, of the Suda? Mm. Uh, we have to, because we know how a lot of communities, they have been destroyed, people killed. Uh, <coughs> 
So we'll, we'll con to continue to continue with that. You don't think because there's a lot of talk about civilian protection forces, not a peacekeeping force because there's no peace to keep. But is that something that you think the African Union might throw their weight behind? The, the African Union might uh, throw its, its weight behind that. They are looking at various solutions. Uh, so in some of their discussion recently, they are going to be having the Sudan on the agenda. Okay. So, um, well, you've touched on this on your speech, but I just will give you the question in case you wanted to embellish anything you said. It said, as we witnessed during India's and Bra India and Brazil's presidencies, will South Africa's G20 presidency also focus on the theme of global climate finance and the overhaul of the global financial system to support a global South agenda? You've already told us that you think the Bretton's Woods institutions and the multilateral development banks need to have their architecture yeah. um, reformed. Um, but on, are you going to focus on global climate finance? In fact, uh, <coughs> the Minister of International Relations raised this matter uh, <coughs> this afternoon when we met with the Secretary of State, uh, uh, Miliband, and one of the concerns that we raised with him is that not enough funding is flowing to the south. That's a big issue for us. That probably less than 4% of the funding flows to the south. You were being very diplomatic when you said not enough. I mean, <laughs> as you quite rightly say, it's a drop in the ocean. But yes, sorry, okay, carry on. It's a big challenge. Yeah. <laughs> It's a big challenge. We, we do need those resources. Uh, because if we want a just transition, you know, we have to deal with the fact that many people in Pumalanga are employed in the coal mines. So you can't wake up tomorrow and close them. Uh, so I said to the Secretary of State, we also need to train and retrain these people for new opportunities. Uh, so, but anyway, when we engage with them, they said, no, you are quite right, we, we will support. Uh, <clears throat> but we must see that support in real terms. It mm. must come. Mm. Okay. Um, another question on, since we're on the G20, which is what are the themes can we expect to see at the G20 summit in South Africa in 2025? Are any other things that we haven't touched on? You mentioned the creative industries a little bit. What else might be? <laughs> you talked about the sustainable development goals, a renewed yeah, push there, you thought. Solidarity. Solidarity. Collaboration. Yeah. Sustainable development. You know, Marupin has been working a lot on the SDGs, so we're going yeah. to look at them and try and bring a lot of those on, on board. We, we want to make our presidency of the G20 to be different. Uh, must be action-oriented. Uh, you know, I was telling the team in my office when they, they, I was appointed deputy president again, and they said, what do you want to prioritize? I said to them, the speed of execution. Mm. Uh, for me, that's it. Because sometimes government, there's too much bureaucracy, red tape, and I said to them, this must now be our motto, uh, the speed of execution. Let's get things done. Uh, <coughs> so we're going to be watching. That's why we're saying, let's look at what was done before us. Mm. Were these things implemented? How far are they? When we take over, we must make sure that whatever is decided will be implemented going forward. Uh, because that's a problem sometimes with governments. Uh, it is, and you mentioned, um, you know, equality. A lot of people are talking about, in realising the ambitions of the Sustainable Development Goals, that there really have to be equitable partnerships, yeah. which ties into that, you know, reform of the financial architecture that you said, yeah. that there has, you know, got to be an equitable partnership between the Global South and the Global North yeah. so that they can fashion the agenda and be part of, you know, in, in, in the driving, uh, you know, part of the steering wheel. Yeah. That's yeah, important. It's not easy because 
obviously some of the people have been, been enjoying, uh, you know. <laughs> driving the engine. Driving Pushing alone. The, yeah. uh, now they have to share with us, we must come in, a bit of uh, fighting, but uh, we will push. Mm -hmm. We will push very hard. So, um, one here, I mean, you've, you, it says, what are your expectations for the upcoming medium-term budget policy statement as it's the first for the newly formed GNU, Government of National <laughs> Unity? Is your Minister of Finance around? But anyway, you can just give us a broad picture there. The Deputy Minister was here, but I don't see him. Well, oh, there. But, I mean, do you want to say, you no, know, what are your expectations? You know what is... The Deputy Minister is worried. Uh, whenever this question is asked, he says the Minister will be delivering the medium term <laughs> budget statement in October. So yeah. it's like we don't want to say much yeah, until he much. speaks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but obviously, uh, the Ministers of Finance uh, follow the program. Uh, I was once an MEC for finance. So you don't wake up and finance what you think. You finance the government program. So the minister knows we want to grow the economy. We want to fix energy problems. We want to fix logistics, infrastructure. So that's where the money must go. Uh, but also you must cushion the poor. Uh, so one of the things we agreed as, as government, people were saying, what are you going to do about the 350 grant and so on? And we decided, let's keep it. You know, people are struggling out there. You know, you may think 350 is not a lot of money, but to take it away from people who are able to buy bread, it's, it's not right. Uh, so there are things we say to the minister, you have to keep this. And I know that uh, in the previous budget, there was a, a very intense discussion between the Minister of Finance and the President. And at the end, the President said, we keep it. <laughs> 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 You'll see how you finance it. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but come October. In fact, uh, Deputy Minister, you said you'll come back, no? Yes, the Minister is coming back. Yeah. Or, or to the UK? <laughs> you coming for investors? <laughs> Money. Yeah. 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 But I will. I'll urge the students. Uh, please watch the minister in October. Uh, it's normally televised, so you'll see where it goes. Uh, <clears throat> but we have to ensure that the priorities of the GNU are adequately covered. Okay, good. And a final question now, because that's all we're going to have time for, is um, what advice does the Deputy President have for students? I don't know if you're qualified to answer that, given that you have pressed the pause button on your own studies, <laughs> frankly. But nevertheless, you may feel bold enough to answer that question. <laughs> it was what advice does the Deputy President have for students? <laughs> You must be disciplined. <laughs> uh, you must be disciplined when you study. Uh, you know, you don't have a lot of work like me. Uh, so focus on your studies and complete quickly. Uh, we need you out there. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, sorry, I, I, I'm told I forgot to acknowledge the High Commissioner. Of, of the UK in South Africa is here with us. And by the way, he's the one who was helping to arrange most of these engagements. Thank you. Well, we thank you also, We're High Commissioner. With, uh, thank you. Working with our own High Commissioner. And, the, uh, and South Africa's High Commissioner in the uh, UK, yes. But to, to all the students, I, I wish you well. And uh, as I said, I'm sure having seen all of you uh, I'll be able to juggle between G and you and studies from SOAS. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Your Excellency, Paul Mashatile, the Deputy President.
of South Africa. And, uh, you know, thank you very much indeed for uh, your patience with us. I um, also thank you uh, as well, Marapini. I want to um, invite to give the vote of thanks and just to make some brief closing remarks, Professor Arkeba Okube, who's a British Academy Global Professor. Do come to the stage. You're kind of uh, pinned down there, aren't you? Um, but we thank you very much indeed, Deep, Mr. DP, because um, we know you've had a very, very busy, exhausting schedule. And um, we are very grateful that you made the time for us here at SOAS. Arkeba. Thank you, uh, President Zainab. We are very proud of you, and, uh, and uh, today's moderation uh, has been exceptionally great. I would like to thank my South African brothers and sisters for sharing with us uh, the update after this GNU, which is a new concept and a new experiment, I believe, and, and also uh, with the occasion that South Africa will be a member of uh, the host of G20, in the coming few months. So it's extremely uh, a privilege for all SOAS community, students, staff, uh, leadership of the school, to listen to your uh, presentation and, and have learned a lot. I have been following South Africa's economic path and, and political process for quite a long time. Uh, in my previous uh, uh, position as a policymaker, and also former mayor of Addis Ababa. When I was the mayor of Addis, uh, President Mbeki at that time said in 2003, have a sister city established with Johannesburg. And he said, close to my ears, Johannesburg is a rich city and you must try to come together. And, and we, have, we, we signed sister city agreement in 2003 in Johannesburg and have been following closely uh, South Africa. Uh, and uh, I must mention, I'm a very proud uh, SOAS alumnus. And, and all students at SOAS, you must be proud of this school because this is an extraordinary uh, educational institution. Uh, and, and because of the... <laughs> I, want, I want to highlight two, three points why SOAS is unique. The first thing is, it's a school that entertains all types of views, pluralism, multidisciplinary views, and it's a very diverse community. And when I did my PhD many years back, I was recommended with few universities. And the university that I chose was SOAS because it's non-conventional, it's a specialist on Africa, and also where freedom of uh, expression is widely entertained. So allow me to thank teachers at SOAS and research supervisors, uh, leaders, who have been also uh, dedicated to work at this school because SOAS has been unique and distinct because of your contribution. Then I would like to highlight uh, South Africa is a source of pride for the continent. And I mention this because in South Africa's policymakers, you shouldn't think about South Africa only. South Africa is an economic powerhouse of the continent. And the expectation is how can South Africa be a catalyst? How can it be a role model in various fields, especially in the economic field? So we have seen in the last 30 years fundamental transformation of the political structure landscape uh, it, everything cannot be changed, obviously. We have seen the transformation of the economy, and we have observed that growth has been a challenge, job creation has been a challenge, inequality has been a challenge. But also, South Africa has become uh, a primary player in G20, BRICS, and also African Union uh, processes, especially Initiative of NEPAD. So the expectation as you are now at this point I believe it's important to consider the importance of South Africa's success because we need more success stories in this continent uh, as we are in a difficult uh, stage. Finally, I also should mention the green transformation and the decarbonization process is going to be the biggest challenge for South Africa. 
So we wish you all the best. I would only like to, uh, like to highlight uh, SOAS has been a partner of South African government immediately after the end of apartheid. It organized uh, training and leadership development for policymakers. This is 30 years back. And uh, SOAS has excellent partnership with many universities, UJ, WITS, Cape Town, many, many universities, because South Africa is blessed with the uh, leading universities in Africa, among the top 10 South Africa standards at the highest point. So SOAS is ready to support the South African government in leadership development, in policy research, in teaching uh, uh, partnership, and also networking with South African uh, universities. And I want to reassure you that uh, the SOAS community is dedicated to partner with you, and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Arkebe. And there's a, a reception now for um, those who are able to attend. Oh, you want? To, yeah, go on. Well, carry on. You still? <clears throat> when I when I spoke earlier, I said many of those who studied at SOAS are ministers and CEO of corporates. Uh, so when I left after my meeting with the Secretary of State now uh, for Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, let me. I said to him, I um, said, what are you going to do? I leave you. I said, no, um, I have a meeting with the Deputy Prime Minister, then Miliband, then I'm going to to SOAS uh, to speak there. He said, oh, I also studied at SOAS. <laughs> so you see? <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank you so much. 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 Th